welcome back to the Exynos Zinga Show, episode number one, two, five, uno, dos, cinco, with me, estas me, it's me, Agostino, what's going on, how you doing, hope you're fine, well hydrated, well rested, well lubricated, because we're gonna get right on into this motherfucker, I'm fresh off, um, coming, you know, I'm fresh off a DJ set, at, um, Tabis, which was which went down a, a, an absolute storm, you know, the twenty five people that are there, so that was amazing. Um, <clears throat> no, um, yeah, I'm fresh of a set, not feeling as rough as I usually would have felt. Um, again, I think sober October has some re- really good residue effects because what it means is that because I did sober October when I was, you know, DJing quite regularly on a weekend it forced me to be in environments where people were drinking alcohol and don't drink alcohol which is obviously a good little reaffirmation that i don't have a problem with alcohol which is nice to know that i'm not alcoholic or anything all right um but also it allows you to kind of temper your drinking somewhat so i'm not as um preoccupied with getting myself fucked um in order to have a good time and because i've spoken quite at length on this podcast and to people in general about my obsession with nightlife i feel as if sometimes you know my obsession with nightlife is the natural nightlife you know going out and meeting people and have people having their guard down and wanting to make friends and wanting to hang out wanting to fucking make a business plan you know you you stay making business plans when you're fucked right when you're fucked up you stay making plans about going places the amount of festivals i've said i would go to with people who i didn't know right it was fucking embarrassing um so you that's what I liked about it, right? The idea that you could go out and kind of, you know, you could be in a nightclub and I'd love to see the, it might, this is really weird, but imagine this assessment. I'd love to see everyone whip out their passport. Everyone whip out their passport. <coughs> 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 Fuck, the CIA is coming to get me. Um, I'd love that everyone just whip out their passports on a dance floor, right? To see who, like where everyone's from. I bet you'd see so many like, you know, different, um, birthplaces and places of citizenship it's like an amazing smorgasbord of personality that's why i like nightlife right everyone from all corners of life comes out in celebration of get of getting fucked up but what i realized that during Swag october is that the process the kind of you know the joint um process of kind of getting fucked up is what makes it fun right the you know trying to secure a dealer the trying to find out what best club to go to trying to um decide what lineup is the best one to commit to where to buy your tickets do you queue do you not uber bus that is the actual fun bit of it the alcohol and the drugs is don't get me wrong it can help it can um enhance the experience but what actually is fun is getting together with your friends and kind of you know figuring it out along the way and then making some new friends along the way and just kind of you know having fun in that moment right someone falling over someone fucking up an order at mcdonald's that's what's actually the fun bit about it the actual getting fucked up isn't that fun especially once it gets over the point of no return it gets to the end it gets a little bit silly so sober october taught me if anything to kind of you know just enjoy the actual ambiance right i i much more enjoy people that are fucked up as opposed to I enjoy myself getting fucked up, which is a really weird assessment. But I, because I remember in the beginning, I was getting quite annoyed with people that were drunk because when, when, you, when you're doing, when you're upsetting from alcohol, you realize how touchy feely, how invading of privacy, how repetitive people are when they're drunk, right? It's annoying. It's annoying, as Chris Lee would say. But after you get over that, you start to appreciate, like, you start, I start to find humor in the fact that these adults or people, whoever they are, uh, you know, have, you know, want to talk to me or want to share, I don't know, an intimate detail because they've had a rough day and they've, they're, they're kind of inhibitions are down because they're having, having a drink. That's quite cool. It's quite funny. Um, you can have some very, um, <clears throat> some very genuine <clears throat> connections in that brief little moment. And of course, next morning, he or she will end up regretting that they end up spilling their details about their rocky marriage to some random DJ in a bar in Stratford, right? I'm sure they would not like to re- recount those details. But, it's nice anyway regardless so i've um i've kind of started to appreciate that and you know you 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 get given some drinks when you dj that's part of the kind of you know, you know the kind of a law that kind of gets people um to play in those kind of bars um where they pay you kind of a low minimal a low kind of dj fee um but yeah you get given drinks and stuff and you can abuse it you can go a bit crazy but i tend not to i tend just to kind of rope it in so much so that i'm drinking half pints imagine me drinking half pints like, I'll have a couple half pints, and then I might just switch to water and just leave it as that. Because, you know, it's a craft beer place. I don't have to drink too much beer nowadays because, you know, you don't want your gut to get all fucked up and shit. 
and sometimes it has the point of dimension returns. You know, they serve you the, the beer usually in a really warm glass um, cup that hasn't been chilled or anything. And, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's not the best idea to kind of be drinking pints all the time in London. But sometimes, you know, in a craft beer house, drinking half pints is quite nice. You get a taste, you know, different ales and stuff. So that's quite cool. But then you just stop, you know, then you just switch the water and just continue DJing and you have a good time and you go home. So I'm feeling nice and fresh, ready to go. I'm even showered, which is really weird. Sometimes on the weekend, I don't even shower because, you know, I'm fucked up and hungover. So I'll just be in my bed all day. And I won't shower again until I go running on a Sunday or some shit, which is bad. So it means like a day and a half I haven't had a shower. But today I'm showered. I'm well moisturized. I've got my new cocoa butter with the squidgy top on it because I had a bit of money this month. So I bought the one with the where you press it instead of the, the one that you flip open and you squeeze. Because the squeeze gets annoying after a while because you have to keep beating it out. You know, like um, like a fucking peasant. You have to find a way of making a bottle um where you can squeeze out the cream without having to bang it. It must be a, a t- there must be a, a, an engineering or design way to kind of figure that shit out. <clears throat> My head straight away, I'm going to meet if I fucking lube the insides of it more. But <laughs> I'm sure that's not how you're gonna figure it out. But it must be a better way to design a bottle where it can, you can get maximum um <clears throat> maximum cream for your buck. Because at the moment when you Especially, I don't know if anyone uses cocoa bar. When you do use cocoa bar and you and you use it towards the end, you loads of loads of bits get caught in the neck because the neck's quite slim. It kind of it's quite fat at the bottom, and then it kind of slims up to when it goes to the top. So you get loads of cream stuck in the lid there. So hopefully they can change it. Maybe they won't, but let's see. Anyway, actually, this English episode number one two five. We're getting right on in this motherfucker because United are playing in a, in a few minutes. So I don't want to, you know, uh, miss the match, even though it's going to be a fucking shit show. Um, I'm sure of it. Um, but you never know, right? I don't want to miss the match on Malaki, so we're going to get right on in to their subjects at hand. Okay, cool. What have I got here on my list? Um, no, 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 no. Oh, before the list, actually, talking about alcohol. Um, here's a beer that I bought in the craft beer place. Actually, it's a five percent. It's a five percent beer from Belgium. It's called Wheatkirk. 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 As you can see here on the camera, Wheatkirk. Wheat. Wheatkirky. Wheatkirky. Wheatkihiri. Anyway, um, it's from Belgium. It's a product of Belgium. It says here on, on the front. It's five percent alcohol. I'm gonna open it up before we start and get this party going. Let's get right next to the mic. Get some ASMR going here. All right, you can see that. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Cheers to Saturday afternoon. All right, so mm, that's tasty. Here we go. So, um, supposedly, um, cocaine has an impact on a country's GDPR. Who would have thought it, huh? Who would have thought it? Um, interesting little reel here or uh, article that I saw here on the Baby Shay. Hopefully, if it loads up quickly here, which is true, which is kind of you know not shocked news to me because um, I've read this book called Zero Zero Zero, which I might have behind me. It's by a guy called Robert, Roberto Saviano, who also is the author of a book called Gomorrah, which the TV series on Sky Atlantic is based on. Gomorrah is like based on these um Calab- Calabri, um no, so Calabri um. Naples, Naples based um gangs um you know and their kind of whole rise and prominence in that part of Italy and Roberto Saviano is like one of the leading journalists that kind of reports on that shit um and he's so much so he kind of uncovers so much detail in the whole assessment of the reporting that his life's been um you know his life's been put in danger he's had hits on his on himself for a long long time so much so he has to live in hiding he constantly walks around with security guards like imagine a imagine an author right um a journalist having to ha- hire security because he's he's kind of unmasked the truth behind the how deep the drug game runs especially within europe it's fucking insane it's tied into so many things it's kind of it's kind of unsettling how much is tied into it. and it all comes from this tiny little powder that they get from south america so i'm gonna try and see if this works so last time it didn't work um playing the audio through on the thing but i've got this little um video from bbc that kind of details some of the bits on it but Hopefully it plays. Let me see if I can get it up on here. Or oh, will, will, will they yank me on YouTube for if I play this? Maybe they might yank me. I'm not sure. Will they yank me? Hopefully they don't. Let me see if it plays. Um, can it play? When buying cocaine yeah, actually there you go. helps the government out. One day, the National Crime Agency received information that a tugboat sailing off the coast of Scotland might be carrying drugs. They sent out a low-flying plane to find it. Then a Royal Navy warship and a large border force ship to intercept it. Below deck, hidden in a tank, they found 3.2 tons of cocaine. 
worth £512 million. It was the biggest ever seizure of Class A drugs in UK history. Good news for the government, you might think. But in terms of how we measure the economy, this is actually bad news. Sales of illegal drugs like cocaine are counted towards our GDP, or gross domestic product, the main way the government measures how well the economy is doing. So that tugboat getting intercepted meant lower GDP. But governments want GDP to go up, what they call economic growth. To calculate GDP, we count everything that's made in the UK minus what we put into making it. So if a coffee shop sells £100 worth of cups of coffee, but spent £10 on buying the coffee beans to make it, their contribution to GDP would be £90. And just like buying coffee, buying cocaine technically helps our economy look bigger. Critics say GDP shouldn't include things that have a negative impact on society and also point out it doesn't take into account our impact on the environment. But what do fucking critics know? But that's mad, isn't it, right? So imagine that. Imagine cocaine contributing to a country's GDP. That's fucking insane. But the kind of it kind of correlates a little bit to the whole nightlife, nightlife economy thing that I keep rattling on about, about, you know, local councils such as Hackney um curtailing or putting in place these kind of draconian licensing laws that prohibit new places from opening up past 12 a.m 12 p.m or 12 a.m wherever right so new bars and clubs cannot open past 12 a.m right the 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 issue here is that most if like if, if imagine a bar like hackney right you're bubbling you're prospering you've got a nike store you've got an m and i don't know imagine you've got waitress i think anyway you've got these all these big shops opening up because when Pret, Starbucks, and these things come to your area. It's usually a sign that your area is kind of on a, on a come up, right? It means that you know young, um, um, young, I don't know, young adults, young people wanting to, or kind of people like a little bit older are coming into the area. They're kind of traversing. They're maybe setting up shop. They're starting families, blah blah blah. So they kind of want these brands and stores that they kind of come accustomed to in their kind of working environment, maybe in central London or wherever it may be. So they kind of have these kind of little, little spots pop up. So when you see a Pret and eat a Starbucks um a waitrose and mns all these kind of places pop up in your area it's usually a sign that your bar is doing quite well it's kind of on, on the up and up and stratford's a good example of that you know we've got a starbucks we've got a pret a manger we've got a westfield shopping center like you know it's, it shows it's signs there that it's kind of coming up right even though it's got some rough edges so if you're if you're a bar like hackney it's going to be hard right to kind of um kind of wrestle with the idea that even though your area is popping up and is jumping right um part of the reason why or most of the reason why is because of the nightlife economy right i think Yes, Hackney is a great area in the day, but I think the place where it really separates itself is from like 6 p.m. onwards, right? From restaurants to bars to galleries to theatre spaces. These are the things that are actually contributing to the or adding to Hackney's appeal. But if you're a resident and you're seeing the the negative sides of it because you're you know you live next to a club and you're seeing uh vomit at the end of your stairwell or you're seeing piss in front of your door, it can be fucking annoying. But you can't introduce licensing laws that can completely curtail that kind of expansion because what's going to happen is that you end up uh, creating like a very sterile, not sterile, but a very boring area, right? In the in a in the same sense like Stoke Newington, right? No one's going to Stoke Newington to go let their hair down, right? You're going to Stoke Newington to go get a haircut to go pick up some fucking um, vegetables and shit, but you're not going there to go let your head and have a good time. No one goes to Stoke Newton to go tear it up for them for the most part. And maybe Stoke Newton residents don't want that, right? But you don't want to turn the whole of Hackney into Stoke Newton because then it wouldn't be Hackney anymore and it'll be quite boring. The whole point of Hackney is that it's got this kind of raw energy to it, right? From the places in Hackney Wick to the places in Hackney Central to the places in Dalston. That's what kind of gives it the energy. But, you know, you kind of, have, again, with the council, you kind of have to weigh up the, the complaints of the residents. You also have to kind of um, weigh up the pros from people that are opening these spaces. And I guess same sort of thing happens with the GDP um, when it comes to cocaine for countries right because we've got weird drug laws anyway right we have a very strange association with drugs which is interesting because you know we fucking love our alcohol here in the, in the uk and most parts of europe but for some reason our drugs have got this weird kind of like taboo towards it right but there's no conversation really have being had a serious one about legalizing class a drugs it doesn't really exist because everyone's so scared of the net negative that's going to happen to society but you know like for the most part we're adults right adults should be allowed to decide what they put inside their bodies and if governments are going to uh, are going to equate um g uh, cocaine sales into gdpr right or the cocaine trafficking into their gdp what's to say it wouldn't be you wouldn't be far off to suspect that some people in with in high echelons of government are getting you know um what would that what would you say they're getting paid under the table 
um, for some of some stuff getting in, right? Because sometimes when you see these big seizures happen, you sometimes have to think to yourself, is this a is this a PR move, right? To to kind of like sh- uh, give the public assurances that um, they are trying to fight this w- war on drugs, which has kind of been an absolute fucking failure, or is it? someone hasn't been paid adequately enough and they're kind of sending a warning shot to i don't know a cartel boss or whatever it is that you know you you need to pay me because i can get all your shit seized because i don't know what because that the seizures are one thing because you know you know for a fact things are going to get seized right you know when you you know when you order stuff from amazon that sometimes your stuff might not arrive sometimes it might come late you just know it right even though amazon for the most part is pretty has pretty good service you know even that happens sometimes you go sometimes you order shit on uber eats right for McDonald's and it comes in and it's the wrong order or they miss an item. Shit happens, right? Sometimes stuff stuff, stuff stuff doesn't get through. But we don't believe that that's they're actually winning, right? We don't actually believe that we, you know, there hasn't been a time I don't think there's ever been a time there might be a drought in some some cases, right, where good stuff isn't getting through, but I don't think I've ever heard of a person tell me that they can't they're not able to get drugs because it's completely sold out. It doesn't necessarily or oh, there's no one available. It doesn't necessarily happen, does it? You don't even let, you don't ever hear that. So we know stuff is getting through. How it's getting through is anyone's guess. Um, but you have to surmise that some people in higher echelons of government are receiving some sort of benefit when those things get through. Because how else are they going to keep getting through? If it's such a if it's such a bane on society and if people are so scared of drugs, then why would they let anything through, right? But you know, I guess you can't police the whole entire nation. But yeah, it's interesting, man. Imagine accounting GDP. Imagine accounting cocaine for GDP, but then you don't legalize actual uh, class A drugs very weird very strange but on the same side of it you know we have a very weird connect we have a very weird um relationship with um alcohol in the uk so maybe some people would fear that you know we can't even we can't even handle um cheap beers at weatherspoons imagine if they kind of legalize class a drugs what's gonna happen in this country um there's a little we're a bit of a nanny state in that regard right like you know that we don't want everyone to get hurt right yo-yos get banned in schools every year oh you don't want the kids getting hurt you don't want someone losing an eye i think it's actually good if a kid loses an eye next time he knows not to stand so close when someone's doing a fucking round the world and a fucking yo-yo right? it's actually a good idea to kind of let kids get a bit fucked up right someone riding a hoverboard and running into a girl on the playground maybe she'll realize to kind of be aware of her surroundings or maybe the kid on the ho- hoverboard will realize that maybe you shouldn't ride a fucking hoverboard in a school playground uh, i don't know but what do I know? But yeah, that's an interesting article that I saw on the internet. So I thought it was funny. Um, what's next on here? She had a, do I want to speak about that? No, I don't want to speak about that. It's not my business. Move on to that. Uh, oh, this is an interesting topic. I, I titled it, I don't like Blondie McCoy and I don't know why. <clears throat> now, let me kind of preface this by saying um, I am no fan of that whole Palace crew, of that whole brand Palace. I'm no fan of it. I've never have been... Uh, no i have been sorry in the beginning i was i bought two t-shirts from palace in the beginning um when they first started actually like the probably the first couple of tees that they put out um no i bought maybe four t-shirts yeah i bought two trifag t-shirts the first ones they brought out i bought uh the medusa with the um, with the medusa with the um, italian kind of colorway um kind of imprinted on the thing right like a flag and i bought a one with kind of a statue on it that my brother wears his pajama which is fucking insane right it's an actual um rare kind of thing in his kind of group but hey but from the outside looking in i was kind of you know i'm I'm always able to separate you know the kind of end product and the person i can do that sometimes sometimes you know when i think someone's corny i can still buy the product if i think it's cool i don't mind doing it right it's easy to do but then it kind of gets harder when you meet the people in real life you're like oh man i don't like you you know what i mean like just in general right or you kind of get a weird vibe right so um our preface is by saying that when i used to work at a store somewhere in london i remember bumping into someone involved in palace and kind of trying to have a conversation with them about the brand right i was a fan i was like, oh my god right this is someone's making a cool brand it's this kind of like um um european version of supreme but done in a very authentic way they're not even trying to rip what supreme is doing it's coming from a very particular place a very particular aesthetic even though i don't like all of these aesthetics i like some of the pieces and the, the brand direction how they're handling um stock how they're handling merchandising how they're handling stock um like i just love the whole approach behind it. i thought it was very very um cleverly done and um when i bumped into this person trying to have a conversation i was made to feel I was kind of, I wouldn't say brushed off, but I was kind of given the old, like, you know, like, who the fuck are you? Do you know what I mean? That kind of, you know, not cool enough. It happens a lot in London, right? Um, sometimes, you know, if you don't have the necessary, uh, if you don't come in with the right people in a party sometimes in London, you can make, you can get made to feel like um, the the ugly girl at a wedding. 
Like you, you do feel like that. It happens all the time. I'm sure people would know of this kind of experience. You know, you go somewhere one time with no one and you get given no love and then you go in there with someone that's well known and all of a sudden everyone wants to be a friend and shake your hand. It's really disgusting. It's really sick. It's bad. It's in sad indictment on London, but it is what it is, isn't it? We know what London is about. And in the same token, it's negative as a positive because, you know, you can really come up in London. You can come here, graft. You can kiss enough asses. You can hang around in enough places. And if you want to do it, you can really get far because people, I would say, even though it can be a bit clicky, I would say if you're around enough and you put in the work and you do and you show that you're talented and you show your, you know, you're willing to kind of work for free for a bit and you're kind of willing to kind of kiss the ring and bow to people who you know necessarily don't need to bow to but you, you're willing to kind of play the game i think london does reward it reward you in some way shape or form right um such a fast-paced city you can kind of get from zero to 100 really quickly if you're kind of if you kind of have the the work ethic so there is benefits to that kind of clickiness but for me personally being the way i am and being somebody that's kind of independent and i rely a lot on um you know i'm looking at a book here um self-reliance I can't do that shit, right? It's just not something that bodes well with me. I've never been able to do that sort of thing. I just kind of have to do things on my own. I kind of have to always be on my own. I don't have to be the master of my own destiny. And even me just kind of like going up to that person and saying hi and kind of trying to talk was like a really big deal in my head, right? Because I don't necessarily do that sort of thing. I'm, I'm not a fandom kind of dude, but I was like, you know, I just wanted to like kind of give props, like heads up, um, a little nod head, uh, head nod, nod head, nod head, head nod head, nod, 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 nod head. Um, but yeah, but I got met with a fucking fuck off, like kind of, um, um, the mirror and I was like huh I didn't get it I was like okay fair enough in it and then as the years you know kind of um progressed and the kind of image of kind of um palace kind of evolved or stayed the same whatever you want to call it um however you interpret it let's say I kind of just didn't like that whole idea you know that these kind of guys were trying to pretend that they were working class when they weren't and they were caught in these motifs gold teeth sovereign rings like ugh, just there was something about it just seemed a little bit disingenuous i don't know what it is but i just didn't it just didn't seem real i don't know it just seemed a little bit weird right this kind of like i don't know west london gangsters it's just like huh doesn't make any sense like i just don't get it right especially that kind of gritty sense i don't understand what's going on there right um Anyway, so I just didn't, I didn't like it. I thought, you know what, I'm just going to stop. And that kind of experience, I'm not going to lie, did kind of uh, play a huge role in me kind of like stopping. And I just stopped. I never bought anything to do with that brand again. Never, never saw another video. Never interacted with any of their content. Never went to any of their kind of events. And, and I didn't go to any events anyway. I kind of stopped as soon as I left um, that shop anyway. I didn't really go to any industry or kind of seen events. So I just kind of like, you know, took a step back and trying to do my own thing. But that kind of, played a big role in it and then you know a lot of that kind of <clears throat> but you have to give them credit because a lot of that style a lot of that kind of sensibility has kind of continued on and they've got all these little kind of like um they've got these little ambassadors that are kind of taking that message and spreading it around um the uk and europe and they've become you know they become these influencers on social and one of them is blondie mccoy and for the most part he seems pretty cool you know i've watched some interviews with him he seems like a really level-headed dude um everything's going well for him he's got the whole like art thing that he's doing at the moment contemporary art he's got some very big cosigns with Banksy and all that stuff he's doing there he's got some really cool friends you know the Kate Moss stuff blah 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 but I don't know man just that whole look right that whole approach I'm just not sure I just don't know if it's real or not but then I read this interview with him in Vice right which I'm going to load up here and I thought he came across pretty well and he spoke about um the whole alcohol thing which i've been talking about quite a while about maybe you know sobriety and and how you should you should handle it and and coming from somebody like you know coming from someone like me who's kind of you know gone to the depths or gone to the end the other end where you kind of get too fucked up and you realize that maybe it's kind of hampering your career and then coming from his end where he's an influencer and somebody that's on the scene where you kind of have to you know you have to kind of um exude this image that you're you know the life of the party that you're kind of you know this wreckhead sort of thing for him to kind of you know decide that he wants to become sober especially at th that age too because he doesn't look it right he looks like he's fucking 35 but he's actually what i think he's 21 or 22 or something stupid like that 20 years old right so he's really really young so to decide a pro, no, a pro skater with the kind of world that his hands and you know with the art world kind of you know waited with baiting breath until he de decides to make great work to so they can kind of slap huge 
price figures on his artwork and held him as a new um you know the new andy warhol whatever it may be right he's got the world at his hand for him to decide no i'm gonna have safe alcohol is a big deal because that whole scene from galas to gallery events is kind of infested with drugs and alcohol so it's a really really big deal for him to do that so i kind of like this interview from him he spoke really well um again i'm just not too sure what it is about him that just i don't know maybe it's a you have to kind of meet the people in real life maybe it's my um disdain from palace that's kind of playing into it but it's just i don't know i don't know it's like just from the outside looking in again i'm really contradicting myself because i said in interviews he sounds cool but i just don't know what it is about him that just can't vibe with i don't know because again he's 20 years old he doesn't have to give a shit what i have to, what I have to say about anything right um He's fucking smashing it in his own world. He doesn't have to give a fucking damn about me. I'm a no one. I'm a fucking ant towards um, compared to this dude, right? In his eyes. No worries. No doubt. Do your thing, playboy. But I don't know what it is about myself that I just, I just don't know. I can't vibe with it. This kind of image. It's just something really disingenuous about it. Maybe I'm lying. And maybe it's a thing of like, you know, people coming from affluent neighborhoods. Or maybe, maybe because we have this bias being from East London, thinking that everyone that lives in West is affluent or is rich in some sense. Maybe they're not, right? Maybe they're not rich compared to their friends or they're rich compared to us. I don't know. But maybe it's that affluent um, London are trying to co-op, you know, um, working class motifs. And again, I'm not one for like cultural appropriation and all that social justice thing. But I just don't know if it's real. I don't know if it's authentic. Um, but again, this interview is really cool. I recommend you check it out. It's on uh, Vice he comes across very very well and um let me see if i can find a bit where he talks about his sobriety da -da 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 -da. um yeah so it's good it goes here um it's a blondie mccoy speaking skateboarding is only sport where the more you have an entire plonker you are the more celebrated you'll be which is very true um being a young person in skateboarding it's not all that cool to be sober um i think the other person that's really big on the whole sobriety thing is alex olsen right i'm pretty sure um, he's a vegan as well and does you know and i remember that being a big deal in forum but you reading slap back in the day and um sometimes um sidewalk like the more cultured skateboarders used to kind of be looked upon with a little bit you know looked down upon a little bit right if you're like you know you're into working out you're into i don't know health and wellness for the most part um you had a, a particular point of view when it came to how you dressed right um it was kind of looked a bit with a bit of scorn now it's a bit different. I think kids are like a little bit, you're allowed to have a bit more of a personality that's outside of the kind of, you know, skateboarding jock, uh, bro, smashing beer cans on your head. I think it's a little bit more sophisticated, let's say, for the most part. But yeah, um, I do remember that being an actual thing. Uh, I'll continue to, um, what you say here. Um, when uh, when talking about skateboarding and sobriety, because a 20 year old blondie, blondie skateboarder decided to stop doing drugs, not the kind you buy from the back seat of a Skoda. Um, he already quit the, those along with alcohol, but clinically approved pharmaceuticals he'd been prescribed for his bipolar disorder. Um, when they're prescribing this stuff, they don't ask you if you have any past issues with addiction. And I quickly started taking a lot more than I was prescribed, which is very true. I know a few friends have had the same sort of issue, right? You already have an issue with fucking drugs. I mean, with already recreational drugs and alcohol, then you get prescribed an actual, you know, you actually get you have to get you have to, you get prescribed drugs in order to kind of help with an ailment that you might have and what ends up and it has some sort of you know net effects where it kind of i don't know you feel good it has some net benefits towards it what's going to happen you're only going to go one one way um or one way one way jesus um like any other substance i've ever known i pushed it to the point of um some huge dramatic life or death situation as you know as you know, thankfully, it was life, but it was drama. And I was very lucky to get away with it. I went cold turkey and had about three months come down following an overdose on a plane. I didn't know this. Is this like, a, is this like well known news in the scene that Blue McCoy had an overdose on a plane? I had no idea. Um, I'm assuming it must be because he's mentioned maybe it's the interviews. Who's, who's the interview? Who's he speaking to here? As you know, I don't know. Uh, Alexander McKee. Mucky? No, sorry, um, Jamie Clifton. Maybe this guy knows. Maybe it's a scene. I didn't know if it was a scene. Maybe it's true. Um, which must be a fucking nightmare, right? What is there? Is is there a worse place to have a fucking overdose than the fucking airplane? Like Jesus Christ! Especially, especially like, uh, hopefully you're not going to fucking Tokyo, right? Because that is horrendous. Having an overdose on an airplane. What the fuck are they gonna do? They have to. You have to do an emergency landing. I'm assuming, right? Which is wow, what a nightmare! Yeah, so that that must be scary. It's really weird, anyway, because I remember um, I I I, had, I used to have quite an issue. I think maybe that was because I was just so I was such a novice in flying. But I used to have a real issue with sleeping on a plane on a plane. 
my words are getting so slow today. What's happening? Anyway, I just have an issue sleeping on the plane, which I'm sure a lot of people have, but I had a real, real problem with it. Um, I just couldn't get any sleep. I, sometimes when people say sleeping on the plane, oh, I get trouble sleeping on the plane because they can't get seven hours, right? But I couldn't even sleep half an hour. Like, I'd just be awake the whole time and it was so annoying. And there's nothing worse than not being able to go to sleep and knowing you can't go to sleep, right? That fucking frustration, like, fuck, man. And especially when, whenever I can't go to sleep and I'm having one of those times where I feel like I'm on Adderall, I'm always sitting next to somebody who, like, guy or girl, just sits on the chair, gets comfortable, has something to eat, and then goes, knocks out. Every time, I'm always sitting next to people who are just the fucking best sleepers. They just, like, sleep, do you know what I mean? Like, like that. So then um, I remember being told to, by a couple of people, oh, you should actually drink red wine, you know, and, um, and, or, or try and drink some form of alcohol and get a little bit drunk and a bit tipsy, and that will kind of aid your sleeping. Tried that. Guess what? Didn't work. <laughs> you end up getting drunk on a plane and being drunk on a plane is the worst i know some people like it but i think people that like it just like alcohol anyway right um so you might have to look in the mirror on that one but i didn't like it man i didn't think it was fun i thought it was quite quite shit to be on a plane fucking smash you just there's nothing there's nothing worse so i, I can only imagine what uh, being on a plane and having a fucking overdose must be like it must be absolute hell on earth so uh credit to the lad for sorting that out Oh, oh well i'm happy that he's okay anyway um like every episode blah, 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 um which i have no recollection of whatsoever for about 10 days i was eating I, w- I wasn't eating anything not drinking anything losing so much weight i've never ever been in a worse place jesus christ so yeah again i don't know why i don't like this kid because he sounds fucking cool but again something about that image that kind of palace dude with the fucking t-shirt and the jogging bottoms with fucking loafers skateboarding with gold fingers with gold rings on and teeth and shit and saying slang that people using slang that people don't use anymore listening to max b like fuck off you know what i mean like i don't know what it is i don't know i don't know he sounds like a cool dude man he's 20 years old he's got his life together he's got all his hands he's fucking crushing it why why can't i connect with this dude why oh, fuck um <laughs> Uh, da, 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 da. yeah so uh, da, he sounds cool man and he created all this work because he was stuck at home um, recovering from his um overdose which is a fucking cool um thing right so he had this big moment an inflection point in his life you know so like a, a man's fork in the road right where he had to decide which way to go and you know you know one way is going to be hell one way is, might be heaven might be heaven is a precise word to use there um and he decided to do the good thing there so he sounds like a fucking cool dude i don't know why i don't like him but again we can't choose who we like in life sometimes life throws us curveballs and this might be one of mine so yeah um he sounds like a cool dude i'm not gonna i'm not gonna lie he sounds like a fucking cool dude Maybe I'm just kind of hating because I'm hating for the hating sake of it. But who knows? But yeah, check out that interview. It's on it's on Vice. I'll link it in the show notes. Um, but it's called uh, uh, Blondie McCoy has swapped all na- all nighters for art books, which is fucking quite quite a nice title to see, right? Yeah. So yeah, um, check that out. It might be a good inspiration for the kids out there to know that you too can stop being a fuckhead and create great work and maybe have friends like Banty and Kate Moss. Probably not, but maybe you know. Just got to fucking put down the Xanax, put down the fucking tinnies and concentrate on doing good work. And you too could ride for the Palace of Supreme, but maybe not because they're not going to pick you because you're not from West London and you don't have a weird accent and wear fucking sovereign rings in 2018. But who knows? Who knows? Who knows? All right. Um, next. Fuck. What's wrong with me today, man? Ugh. Creator burnout. What the fuck is going on? All right, this is something I've been thinking about for a while, and probably contrary to everyone else's opinion, because everyone's fucking, you know, self prescribing themselves burnout, which is annoying. Anyway, there's been this weird thing right in society nowadays where everyone's self prescribing themselves, you know, as you know, having mental health issues and all that sort of stuff, right? Um, self diagnoses, right? So they're a bit, they've been prevalent nowadays in society. Um, for the most part, I think, as I've said quite a lot of times. I don't necessarily think it's, you know, depression or these mental health issues that some people are speaking about in the scene for the most part. Which I, this is only my only um, area of expertise I can speak on. Not, I'm just talking about a wider public. But for the most part, everyone that's speaking about it, uh, you know, come from, you know, the similar sort of background that I do, you know, kind of work your way up in the scene, try to make a career in it, try and do find your way in. And they're kind of all at the same sort of age, you know, let's say 25 to 35 or 45 you reach that kind of inflection point where you're trying to wonder like is all this work worth it right when am i gonna finally make it when am i gonna get there how come he or she is doing this and i'm not doing that you start to question you know all these things around you fuck 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 and they can bum you out right and then you add into it instagram you add into it twitter you add into it facebook all that social media shit and you're getting to see and you get social media 
uh, flattens out the playing field, right? You see Drake, um, you see all these kind of big people, right? And you think because just on you're on a platform that you're the same, right? If you're an artist, right? You kind of just see Drake, even though Drake is you know way way ahead of you in terms of like um the training that he's putting these ten thousand hours, and he's you know, he's a bigger you know he's a bigger artist, whatever it may be. Um, you kind of think, oh my God, he has that. Why don't I have that, right? It's got this weird thing. It does that to you. In the same token, it can be inspiring to also see Drake doing 55 shows around the country um, with an amazing state production. You'd be like, wow, man, sometime, someday in life, I'm going to be able to do that too in my own way. But in the same way, it could also be annoying. Like, fuck, man, why am I not there? Why is he bringing me out as a surprise guest, right? Blah, 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 blah. So that can kind of add to the anxiety, to the kind of quote, unquote depression, to the feelings of like in um in inadequacy right but they're not necessarily mental health issues just like you know it's like i think for the most part it's like a, a crisis of career right it's like a middle it's like a quarter life crisis where you're kind of fucking thinking fuck 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 and especially if you're kind of the person I mean, most people in the scene have friends who kind of went the conventional route or they have friends that went the kind of um um vocational apprenticeship route right who kind of did the whole carpenter um electrician plumbing sort of thing you got people that did went to law school did that whole shebang and you and once you get a little bit older when you when you're in the mid-20s you don't see the benefits of it like oh how can you be doing that you know that's a shitty job but when you get a bit older you start to kind of envy that stability right they have like a set salary they have made good money they have a company car they have a little family they bought a house they go on holidays all the time you start to wonder shit man like fuck maybe I, I picked the wrong career right because this whole creative sort of field right is you know there's a lot of eating shit right you just have to start doing stuff on your own with no audience right with no one giving a shit and then suddenly over time it will pick up and maybe people will start giving a shit and you'll get attention and you have brands will start wanting to work with you but in the beginning it's a fucking slog right it's no make no bones about it this is a good example um but that can make you question things, especially when you go on social media, you see people that are the same age, younger than you, fucking smashing and be like, oh my God, why is it not me? But sometimes it can be, you know, that's usually the point I say most is the kind of mental health issues are coming from. And then there's this other side of it now happening that's spreading on YouTube called Create a Burnout, where all these YouTubers, especially the biggest ones, are saying that they're finding it hard to kind of keep up with the kind of constant need for new content, right, from their audience. And they're having Create a Burnout where they're not being able to make new videos. And some of the big creatives or some of the big creators on YouTube are having, like, when you go on their video page, you see they haven't uploaded things in, like, I don't know, four months or whatever. And the, the fans decide to wonder when you're going to upload a new video and then they don't look and the creators themselves don't know when they're gonna upload it because they're not really feeling inspired they feel like they don't have any new ideas blah blah blah, blah. and uh, and it's a kind of annoying me because i don't necessarily f uh, i i think it's a little bit um hmm, what's this? so it's like uh they're not understanding what this entertainment racket is all about at the highest level right for the most part, some of these YouTube stars would never be hired by big kind of networks, right? Because they wouldn't want to take that risk, right? YouTube allows creators to kind of make shit, um, kind of like, you know, uh, you know, just make, just record stuff on your phone, upload it onto YouTube and you've got, you know, you you can create sketch shows and whatever you want to do. Like there's so much creative freedom in that, right? You can, the, the distribution platform is amazing. Everyone goes to YouTube to go watch videos anyway. you got a captive audience right there. And it's just, you know, it's really cool. But networks don't operate in that kind of realm. But the biggest stars, The Rock, the Kevin Hart's and all those kind of people, there's a reason why they're at the top. Because if you look at someone like Kevin Hart, right, um, when that Night School show came out, um, the movie, sorry, with him and Tiffany Haddish, I went on YouTube now because I think I must have saw like so much bits of content about Kevin Hart and Tiffany Haddish doing this game show, doing that interview. I was thinking, how many, where has Kevin Hart been this whole year? He's been everywhere. So I quickly did a YouTube video search of him. When an upload date, during the time um, night tells a uh, night school was coming out, and he had been, I don't know, in maybe 15 different countries in the space of six weeks, right? Promoting this movie, like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's what it that's what it requires, right? In order to, to 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 maintain, to keep up that, to keep that machine going, he has to do that, right? So sometimes these big YouTube stars, I think they were unaware. Like once you reach that kind of like a hundred thousands, one million subscribers, you are in in YouTube in online world. You are as big as The Rock and Kevin Hart. You're well known in that field. You're one of the A star people, right? You have to do that. Like if PewDiePie decides to stop doing daily videos, his audience will go nuts. They're expecting that now because he's just you know he's he's done like you've 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 kind of made your bed. You have to lay in it. Or your big. This is kind of the responsibilities of being one of the biggest stars in the world. You have to put out a lot of content, um, 
And I just think it's a little bit, there was just, I don't know, maybe it's naivety in terms of some of these YouTube creators where they kind of thought that because it's the internet, you could kind of get away with uploading sporadically every once, or every other month or whatever. But you can't do that. You just can't. It's just, you, you can if you want to. But that's not what got you to the dance. What got you to the dance was kind of vlogging every day, um, making cool videos, coming up with interesting sketches, um, interviewing a controversial guest, like thinking of new ideas, like come, going for it, going for it, going for it. That's what got you to the dance. And then suddenly now, you, now you're kind of at the, you know, on the big stage. You're like, oh, you know what? There's too many people here. It's making me uncomfortable. Like, come on. What the fuck is going on? So this, in, yeah, so this, I think this thread on, on Twitter kind of exemplifies some of the things that I'm not necessarily agreeing with. I saw randomly, um, get it up on here, some woman called Stephanie Foe, I'm not sure who he is, she is, but she went to this conference called Work It, which is all about inspiring women within the, I think, the digital space, but this thread is a lot of this stuff, I don't really agree with it for the most part, but I'll read some of it out, so Stephanie Foe, handle on Twitter is, uh, oh, that's nice, good, good handle, I'm on the radio, which is um, all, all one word, um, so she says on Twitter the following my takeaway from work it 2018 a podcasting conference just for women or oh, it was a podcast conference not a um, um, social media thing was that many of us are burnt out there were sessions on building healthy boundaries saying no work-life balance while while I'm glad that is it was a safe space for those convos I'm also disturbed there's a really big movement now happening again this is me speaking not, not a tweet but there's a really big movement happening now within kind of the entrepreneurial space where everyone's kind of anti-hustle porn I don't really know what's happening here. Um, I know the whole hustle thing is a bit annoying. Work hard, put in the work, be, you know what I mean? All that sort of stuff, all that rah-rah bro shit is annoying. And sometimes it doesn't account for actual talent, actual being good at what you do, right? It's a little bit bro -y and all that sort of malarkey, no days off, all that shit. I know it's annoying, but um, there is an aspect to it that really lends itself true, right? Like you do have to work hard. That's the one thing that I don't think gets said enough because for the most part, people kind of think, you know, you can just kind of like skirt through life and, or especially in the social media scene, right? Um, everyone's kind of waiting for that moment where someone big um, retweets or shares your thing and you, you, you become, you, you blow up, right? But I think in, even in social media, for the most part, we've seen, there are no overnight sensations for the most part. Even if you do blow, it's because you blow because you were, oh, you saying blow too much, you might end up blowing. Hey! No, stop that. Um, oh, shit. Uh, because uh, for the most part, there are no overnight, no overnight sensations because even when you look at someone that pops overnight, um, what you do see is like a consistent uh, ap approach, right? Someone that's been uploading regularly, that's been doing a lot of good work. And then, you know, they had the one piece that kind of, you know, taps into the current zeitgeist and currently catches steam. And everyone's like, oh my God, this person's amazing. But it's never really like one thing. It's never like a blog with one entry. Uh, this this is the blog that's going to break the internet. And you just post once and that's what gets you on. No, it's consistently posting and someone will eventually see it. And then it eventually gets shared. And then, you know, that, that's where it happens. But this anti-hustle thing is annoying because it's usually coming from people who have maybe made it. It's sort of like the Ariana Huffington thing, right? The woman that founded the Huffington Post. She's got this annoying book about sleeping better, right? This word, lady's worth a gazillion dollars, right? And she's telling us we need to get more sleep in order to live a healthier life. No, bitch, you need more sleep because you're a fucking alpha female who's running a big fucking um, conglomerate, a big fucking behemoth of a company racking in millions of, of cash you kind of burnt yourself out and you're starting to realize that in order to kind of be an optimal performer you need some more sleep it's hard because when you're an alpha you kind of feel like you always have to be on 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 so to kind of pull back and kind of get seven hours you kind of feel like your competitions are your competitions gaining hours on you because the, 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 the time you're sleeping they're not sleeping right so it's, it's, it's that idea you know like when they're sleeping i'm working when i'm working they're, they're sleeping whatever that fucking thing is right but Ariana Huffington needs more sleep in order to kind of be a good ceo but when you're in a come up and you're a girl writing a zine that no one gives a shit about and you want to become the next Huffington Post or you want to become the next Days and Confuse, you have to work hard. You have to pull all nighters. You have to come back from your bar job at 9 p.m. and start writing and start printing and start photocopying shit until the wee hours of the night and then do it all over again the next day. You have to do that. You just have to. And for these people that are at the top now to suddenly look down on us and say, hey guys, you guys should stop taking, you guys should be, you guys should relax and have a better work life balance, right? It's like, what? Yeah, because you're there. But when you don't, you shouldn't have a work life balance when you're trying to make it. You should have, you should be trying to work as much as you can in order to get the life that you want so that then what will happen is that you won't need to work anymore because it will just be, that will be your life. You love it. You love what you're doing. So there won't be any work-life balance anymore because you love what you're doing. Because whenever someone says work-life balance, do you like what you're doing? Because I don't necessarily think that is the case because sometimes, you know, you hear all these um, 
famous um i don't know record executives or there's an artist i forgot her name actually it's a fam- very famous contemporary artist who's like 112 years old right i'm never kidding she's really old and she still paints to this day but she's never you're never gonna catch her saying this is work she loves what she does like it makes her it, it make it's part of who she is it's like breathing right um she can't not do art right so the moment it becomes work is when it gets boring and then that's when you have to start really oh, i've got to walk the dog da, 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 da. but it shouldn't be work-life balance because you should love what you're doing right i don't know anyway let's go back to the tweet because I, you know, I don't want to get too emotional about it it's not that serious but anyway so the tweet continues da, 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 da. stephanie Fur continues with fred um why aren't these prevailing convos at say third coast fest the podcasting con for everyone i wonder if we feel uncomfortable saying it in front of men so imagine right there's a conference for there's a podcasting conference called hashtag work it 2018 right specifically sent specifically aimed at women in the podcasting world now i don't know why there's a conference for only women in podcasting because I didn't know there was an issue. I didn't know there was an issue of women representation on podcast because podcasting is for literally everybody. I don't. I don't necessarily. I didn't necessarily think it was a male dominated arena. But again, what whatever it doesn't matter. They create a, a safe space, quote unquote, for women to have a podcasting um, convention at. They speak about things that you know are prevailing um, issues with maybe women in podcasting industry. Again, I'm not a woman. I'm not a woman, so I don't know what's happening there. But you know, it's probably a safe space in order to kind of speak to your peers. It's cool to do that. And this woman still has an issue with it. She says that, why aren't we speaking about this in front of men? Do we not feel safe around that? What? Why wouldn't a woman feel safe saying that she might feel burnt out because she has to upload too many times around guys? Fucking hell. When, you, when you're ideologically possessed, you just see you see power and oppression in everything, isn't it? Like, even an event that's aimed to, to for you in order to make you feel safe, you think like, oh, why aren't we doing this in front of everyone? Because it's like, what? Anyway... Um, also, since there are no men at this conference to hear any of this, it's it's again the job. It's again the job of the women to do the emotional labor of taking this back to our respective shows and conveying the importance of work life balance or the attempt to draw boundaries and quality alone. This woman's a psycho. So she's annoyed. So she's happy that they've got a conference of people, women in a podcasting arena, right? A safe space so they can talk about the things that are most concerning to women. Then they speak about these things and she's wondering why aren't we saying it in front of men? Are we afraid to say it? Then she's blaming men because she's saying that it's again responsibility for women to go back and tell them what is bothering them because men are not interested in what bothers women until they bring it up. Like, oh, shoot me in the face with a gun. Um, also, since there um, uh, continues, my partner also pointed out that if men in power who have no work-life balance don't hear and adhere to these policies, the only people who will rise are those who adhere to those same work habits that's insane right because what you hear what you hear quite often is that there's not enough female executives right and then a lot of a lot of kind of you know i don't know if i want to talk about this do i care what the fuck this woman's a psycho i don't need to explain this like this woman's a psycho like you can't have all the arguments you can't have all the points like some uh, as um eric weinstein pointed out weinstein pointed out the other day on joe rogan podcast like sometimes there's the best way to uh, argue with people like this is to kind of invite them into the conversation and tell them okay cool everything you're saying is true but it all can't be true at the same time you can't have you can't say there's like a you know women are represented in the podcast arena then have a podcasting event only for women then speak about issues that concern women then get annoyed that that men are not hearing this message it's like Arr! um okay um there was a panel where a one woman said, maybe you need to take a break from this or maybe you need to evaluate or whether you need to want to keep doing this. I saw some heads nodding at, at that. It's a bummer that women who built this industry, who built this industry would feel that way. What? Women shoot? What? When an industry that prov- provides itself on telling others a story is empathy. I, I just think she's nuts. I just think she's nuts. Sorry. I just think she's nuts, man. But anyway, um, the burnout thing, I just don't agree with. I, I think Stephanie Fu is a bit, is a bit ideologically possessed. But you know, we 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 all have our ideologies that we adhere to, so maybe that's hers. But yeah, um, I just I just don't get the whole. I don't get it, man. I don't get the creative burnout thing. I just think you know, if you're if you if you wanted to be at the top of this entertainment apex, and you thought you could upload every other month and still have a captive audience, I think you are well. You someone lied to you. You just have this is what it takes. Every high performer in every industry does probably doesn't have a good work life balance. I just don't think it exists. You have to, in order to be the best performer, you have to sacrifice some things. Your sanity, um, sleep, um, friends, 
something has to go something has to give i just i don't think it exists right like in sport um in medical profession in entertainment i don't think it exists any high performer in the top five percent or top one percent right has a good look work life balance i just don't think it exists i'm sorry it just doesn't exist man you have to just pull all nighters consistently you know just to kind of keep that train moving which is pulled into question should you be looking at that as a point of success right that's where the whole mental health issues come out of it right like you're using the wrong points of reference to kind of compare where you are you're using the wrong gauge the wrong ruler like you know we, we shouldn't we shouldn't all be trying to have one percent life when we're not trying to give up 99 percent of the stuff that we like or enjoy it we shouldn't you shouldn't be trying to have one percent life when you're not willing to make the sacrifices you shouldn't you think you think you think the ronaldo physique comes by chance you think looking like the way he does or performing like just the news just got um leaked or transfer rumor came out that supposedly zlatan ibrahimovic is going back to ac milan for an 18 month contract I, I don't know he's like 37 years old right he has a he has a, a near on career ending injury at united um gets sold to uh la galaxy to kind of wind down his years and kind of you know have a bit of a swan song um refines his form and then gets re-signed to the highest one of the highest leagues in the world one of the best leagues in the world in the Serie A right it's like nutty at that age but that doesn't come by chance you think he has a good work-life balance like come on man this is insane absolutely insane I don't know what's going on nowadays man again that's where the work hard thing needs to be said often because I don't think pe people have a weird I don't know there's a people have a weird kind of warped idea behind what it means to perform at that level I just don't think they get it for the most part. Some people just don't get it. Just don't get it. I don't think they get it that, that they just don't get what is required. I think they just think it just comes falls at your lap and you can kind of do it at a coffee shop, idly diddly. No, man, it, it requires staring at that fucking blinking um, sign on an empty page trying to figure out what you're going to write. Like just staring at it for hours and hours and not have nothing coming up, nothing coming to you until the very last minute. Uh, it's hard work, man, but hey, what do I know? What do I know? Um. Oh shit! The match is actually on, isn't it? It's thirty minutes past. Ah, you know what? Because I'm um a man of my uh, conviction, I think that might actually be a good place to end it because I need to kind of watch this game. Actually, I know I would say I wouldn't do a shorter episode of an hour, but it's actually fifty minutes, so this is close to an hour. It's gonna get. But anyway, this has been next to Zinger Show episode number one two five. I'm off now to go watch United play. Hopefully, we don't fuck up. Um, thanks so much for tuning in, as per usual. Um, I will see you guys again next week for another hot, steamy episode of goodness. As always, check out my site, xenozinger.com, for more information regarding moi and everything I'm up to. And salute to you and your friends and people that you love. I'll see you guys again on the other side. Thanks for tuning in. Zinger out.